of the Lord. All right, Jeremiah chapter number 18 is where we're going to spend our time today. As we continue to uh, press on this month, I'm, I'm, I am excited that we are having a Back to Church Sunday, and it's an opportunity for us uh, as folks are starting to get a rhythm of gathering again, and we don't take it for granted, amen, that some of us are still getting used to being around other folks or being back in the rhythm of coming to church in person uh, versus watching virtually, and so we want to create some opportunities for us this month to keep leaning into what does it mean for us to live together as God's people in community. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18 is is uh, the passage for today that I find to be particularly uh, uh, apropos given uh, the world and the context in which we're living. Uh, if you are familiar with the book of Jeremiah, you would know that Jeremiah was a prophet that was called by God. He was called by God as a very young person, a young boy, as a matter of fact. Uh, Jeremiah chapter number one, it's a very familiar passage of scripture to folks who've been in church all our lives. The passage of scripture, it says that before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I called you to be a instrument, a prophet, a voice uh, in my name, and you will proclaim the good news uh, to all the nations. Now, the good news back then was not necessarily uh, considered the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was this message, a prophetic word, a message, a boldly spoken truth to both the people who were called to live according to God's ways, who had for some reason fallen off. How many know sometimes we fall off, right? Fall off, right? And also speak truth to the empire of its day, the, the, the Babylonians, those folks who had God's people in bondage. And how many know we always have empires we have to contend with, right? And so the prophet's role was not to tell the future of the individuals in Israel. You know, you got prophets running around now, and you know, you give someone a little offering and they'll tell you who your boo's gonna be, right? That's not the kind of prophet we're talking about. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You you know, you, you go to a conference and they'll tell you if you're going to get the house, you're going to get the job. Amen. That's not the prophet that Jeremiah is. Isn't it interesting that Jeremiah had bigger fish to fry than who you was dating? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seemed like there was something bigger at stake than how many cars or houses you were going to acquire. That when a prophet speaks, a prophet is speaking about something that is of ultimate concern. And I want you to appreciate that we're living in a moment and a time where I do believe God is wanting to speak to God's people about things that are of ultimate concern. Paul Tillich talks about ultimate concern. I'm using an insider word, theological language. Y'all like ultimate concern? No, that sounds cool. But Paul Tillich, he's a German theologian. When he talked about ultimate concern, he talked about things that have eternal significance. Things that literally are, are hanging in the balance based off of decisions that you and I will make. And I want you to appreciate that the things that God has placed in our hands to steward, how I many know oh, not everything you steward is of ultimate concern? Not everything that you, every decision you make, every, every, every choice you make is not equally weighted. But how I many know oh, there'll be some moments in your life where this choice will make or break some futures? These decisions will determine an outcome that you may have to live with for the rest of your life. Well, maybe not the rest of your life. That sounds quite eternal, praise God. <laughs> but at least the next 10 years, the next 20 years, next 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And so the book of Jeremiah is one of these passages or one of these prophets who was uniquely called by God. And Jeremiah did not want to be God's prophet. If you go on in Jeremiah's story, you'll find that Jeremiah, you know, was doing what God told him to do and persecution and trouble followed Jeremiah. So Jeremiah told God, I'm tired of this prophecy thing. I think I'm going to go sit down and I don't know, go milk some cows. I don't know. Jeremiah's like, I'm, I don't want to do this stuff no more. Why? Because doing this is bringing me hardship and heartache that I did not ask for. 
How many also know sometimes doing the will of God may introduce tension you did not seek or ask for? And so in this way, I do believe God is, is powerfully speaking to Jeremiah throughout the course of Jeremiah's life. God is speaking to Jeremiah. So as Jeremiah seeks to encourage the people, God can help the people appreciate that the journey of faithfulness is always about God's faithfulness to us as well. That God will not, as the old saints say, lead you where God can't keep you. God won't give you what you can't handle. And so the question is, if you are in a moment, a season, a stage in your life, last week we talked about we will win this season. We will win this season. We were talking about going back to school, right? But I want you to appreciate there's always a season of life that God is inviting you to, 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 to be open to the ways God is trying to sustain us through whatever season you find yourself in. And in this way, Jeremiah chapter 18, I think is a very powerful commentary. Uh, I hope it comes across as a, a bit of a challenge, but also a promise that God will be faithful to God's people. Verse uh, number one of uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. We're going to uh, go ahead and read this passage real quick. And uh, the scripture, the word of the Lord, uh, simply goes along this way. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. The Lord is speaking to Jeremiah and the Lord says, Jeremiah, come, go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. Which kind of says that sometimes you got to be in a certain place in order to hear God's voice. It's not as if God can't speak anywhere. But when God tells you, come on, I need you to go somewhere so you can hear me. Don't you be the person be like, oh, God, just talk to me right here where I'm at. <laughs> Mm. Verse number three, so Jeremiah says, I went down to the potter's house and there the potter was working at his will. And the vessel the potter was making at his will, uh, the vessel the potter was making, uh, the, I'm sorry, the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And the potter reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. And then the word of the Lord came to me, can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, uh, we're going to speak uh, from, from the topic simply today. Uh, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. Mm. So it's in James Cleveland song. God bless the word that has been read for the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts. So we will not sin against you and let your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, please be patient with me. Now pat yourself on the chest and say, God's not through with me yet. God is not through with me yet. One of the great gifts, I think, of Christian faith, theological kind of reflection is this sense that our journey as we walk with Jesus is never uh, 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 caught in the, 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 the jail or the prison of the now. That if you take a, you know, kind of systematic theological breakdown of Christian faith, what you will find is that all through the course of the thousands of years of post-Christian, post-Christ life and the thousands of years pre-Christ life, all these things, they help inform and, 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 and begin and continue a conversation about God's activity in the world 
through the unique kind of lens and experience of a people uh, called Israel and the life, the ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus. This story, this time-bound story, gives us stages, if you will, uh, of, of, of God's continuous activity to redeem the world and in the world you. That when we talk about God's activity in the world, we talk about uh, the, the process of salvation is, is, is often thought to just be about you saying the sinner's prayer and you say, you know, uh, you know, God, I give you my hand, I give you my heart, come into my life. Uh, I accept you, I believe, I confess, I'm baptized, uh, I speak another tongue, roll on the floor, swing for chandelier, and whoo, I'm saved. <laughs> Amen. But I want you to know that there is more to the Christian faith, there is more to the process of your, your, your transformation from who you are today, no matter what your today, when your today begins, who you are today ought not be who you will be tomorrow, ought not be who you will be a decade from now. That the more you walk with God, the more you ought to be transformed into the image, the scripture says, and the likeness of the one who created you. Which gives us to know that there is a spark, uh, theologian origin calls, of the divine in all of us. But a spark is not a fire. And a fire is not a wildfire. Hello, somebody. How many of you know that sometimes we can settle for the least amount of presence of God in our life and be content, not appreciating that God is always trying to work on us. God is always trying to work through us. God is always trying to change the world as it is into a world that it should be. And our job, your job, my job is to be willing to be shaped by the work of God in our lives. Now, if there is a sin that I believe is run amok in this age, and there's a whole bunch of them, but what I find to be most troubling is the error of self-delusion. Because I find that there are so many folk who believe that they are being transformed by God. And yet you are being turned into something that is anti-Christ. I want you to bear with me, amen. This may hurt a little bit of us, amen, but it'll get better by the end. Praise God, because it hurt me when I was writing it. Somebody say amen. I mean, I want you to think of all the moments in your life where you were convinced God was telling you to do this. Only to get to the end and ask yourself, man, was that really God? Any, any honest folk, amen. I just want an honest church. I'm not asking you to do, lie on a Sunday morning, praise God. I mean, there have been moments in my life where I was so sure of a thing. I was so confident that my thinking was God's thinking that I had a confirmation, you know, and there's a passage, a story in the Bible where, you know, I think it was Gideon, he was, you know, trying to figure out, is this God's will? So he put, you know, a, a piece of sheep cloth outside and he said, you know, God, if this is your will, I want this sheep cloth to be wet in the morning and I want the ground to be dry. Goes to bed, wakes up, comes out, sheep, the sheep cloth is wet and the ground is dry. But because he didn't want it to be God's, you know, Said, oh, God, I, maybe I, I said it wrong. Actually, what I want is the ground to be wet and the sheep cloth to be dry. <laughs> Came back the next morning. In the words of who's that colleague, God did it right. Amen. Right? Listen, we did all those kind of confirmations. And we're so convinced that this was God, only to find out after the fact. Man, God, did I really hear you well. 
part of what I think is at stake for some of us, if not many of us, if I say all of us, is that there is a, a ongoing testing that God will seek to do in us that should keep you and I on our toes, if you will. Open to the idea that God, you are still working on me. And that what I may think is God yesterday, I need to be open to the fact that the potter may actually be still working on me tomorrow. And that today and tomorrow uh, may kind of be days apart in the timeline of God. <laughs> I want you to understand what I'm saying. You know, I've grown up in church all my life. And so, you know, when I was in Sunday school and we learned all these things, you know, uh, I, I, I was pretty convinced of what I learned in Sunday school as a teenager. But when I became 30 years old, you know, I realized, okay, Sunday school is a good foundation, but now I got a little bit of life and a little bit of more teaching and training and walking with God. And so, God, I, I, I think I, what I've done and done in Sunday school, now I got a little foundation. Now I'm in my mid-40s, praise God. Happy birthday to all the folks who are getting older. <laughs> <laughs> and you start to realize that God, rather than me parking my car in Sunday school, or parking my car in my 30s, or even parking my car in my mid 40s. Maybe, God, you are actually helping to shape me all along in a continuous way that is transforming me from who I used to be. Not to who I am today as a finished product, but who you would have me to be based off of how you formed me to be. Yeah, you see, part of what I think is so important is we can have a sense of delusion and think that the potter is us. Now, of course, we would never say that because that's sacrilegious. How many know you can not say it, but you can live it? Oh, God, you are the potter. But yet, when you look at who's forming the clay, you forming yourself. And then you wonder, why is it that this continues to look like who I am? How does that play out? Well, if you are only surrounded by people who agree with everything you are, do, say, and think, I would want to offer to you that you may not be the clay in your story. You may be a pseudo potter. Mm -hmm. or, or sometimes we may get a little confused about uh, who is the potter in our life. So, you know, you clear I'm the clay, you know, I'm, 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 I'm impressionable. But the question I have today for us is who has their hands on you? Who is forming us and shaping us and you and I who are following the ways of Jesus must consistently ask ourselves God are you the potter in my life and am I the clay or am I one of these you know uh, 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 self deluded Folk who think that I am the potter and God is the clay. Now again, we would never say these things because it, it just is too disrespectful to utter it. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hey man, when's the last time you told God, you know, God, all right, it's time for you to kind of bend your way to my way of thinking now. This, this, we, I've been following you a little, you know, I tried your way. I mean, we never say it out loud. Hello, somebody. It's quiet up here. I told you it's going to get a little rough or get better, but I'm just here. Man, it was hurting me while I was writing it, so I'm not telling you nothing. I've been wrestling all night. I barely slept. Praise God. <laughs> and you know, it's really important for you and I to wrestle with uh, the question of self-delusion because we are living in a country and a moment where it appears to me that 
A lot of folk claim to be Christians. But I'm confused about which potter is shaping some of us Christians in the American church. Now, you know, it's, it's very easy for all of us, depending on where we sit in the Christian spectrum. You got very liberal Christians, quote unquote. You got very conservative Christians. You got folks all the way in between. And so depending on where you sit on the Christian spectrum in America, you are convinced that you are the good clay. And God's potter hands is just kind of, you know, working everything out in your behalf. But as I watched the president's speech this past week, and I recalled and recall the way we respond to the political leaders we agree with and put God's approval on whatever they say, right? It, it, it made me ask some serious questions about who is shaping us because you know, if Donald Trump was speaking and he had the military all in the background, I'd say that's a fascist move. But you know, I saw you know Biden do it, and you know, it's painted red. I don't, you know, I kind of like the optic. You know, it's kind of it's kind of dope. It's a nice little touch. <laughs> but based on what I liked or did not like about him, I we saw that whole experience very differently. The night before, the day before, Biden was talking about gun violence and the crime wave and how he's going to put 100,000 police officers into the community to address crime. And, you know, if you live in, 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 you know, certain parts of this region or other neighborhoods across the country, we all know that since the pandemic, crime has taken a bit of a spike. I came out of my house this morning and somebody had ran through my car. You know, and you know, there was a moment I looked at that and I said, just who are they? Let me find them. <laughs> but then I had to rehearse in my mind what I say to other folks, right? What kind of desperation are people in that they are willing to put themselves at risk to take from others in order for their own needs to be met. And while I don't like it, the question for us is, why is it that in the wealthiest country, at least one of them in the world, we have people living outside in tents? We have children. 13, 14, 15 year old children who lost loved ones, who took care of them during COVID and they're sleeping in cars. And so in some of the work we find out folks are carjacking folk because they are in such places of desperation. They're not carjacking or stealing from folks so they can go buy a private jet. Most of the young people we work with, when you catch them and you ask them why are you Stealing from folk. Well, I gotta get some food for me and my little brother. Well, where are you and your little brother? We outside this car right across the street from this church in North Oakland. So we're asking the preacher, what is it about us that we'll be more upset about the crime of stealing than the evil of two children living in a car outside of our church? Now the question for us is, whose responsibility is it to solve that? I don't know. Well, I do know. Man, I think that some of that responsibility falls to we who are claiming to be shaped by the potter. But why is it when it comes to the solutions we must vote on or support or scale up, we don't scale up solutions that help the poor. We scale up solutions that harm the most vulnerable and then claim to be following mm, come on now. the potter. So I told someone today or this week, either 
God is lying or we are unfaithful. Now, often whenever I hear the potter and the clay, it often drills down to these kinds of personal defects, sins that we must work out in order for us to be, you know, uh, considered good clay, <laughs> you know. God's got to work out all the sin in your life, and God's constantly reshaping. But I want you to always be reminded that when, 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 when the prophet is speaking to the nation, the prophet is talking about the nations, the collective's responsibility to the collective. And that personal sins are often violations of our interpersonal relationships. People talk about haters all the time. Oh, my haters this, oh, my haters that. Well, what you're really talking about is the way a person you don't like has violated you personally. You just call it a hater. Hello, somebody. When you talk about people who talk about you, you are actually talking about them and their words that have injured you personally. When you steal from someone, it is an interpersonal violation. And when we start to collect up all of our interpersonal violations, how many of you know we have a community that lacks trust and cohesion to care for one another? When the potter is talking about I have in my hand a vessel, clay, but it is spoiled. It is misformed. It has some flaws in it. The potter is not talking about all of it necessarily. The potter is talking about a part of it that makes the whole not look, seem, or be as desirable as it was in the mind of the potter. And that is why I want you and I to understand that the patience we must have with one another is not just about, you know, you being a good person, quote unquote. It's about us understanding that there is a collective process of God wanting to turn we as God's people into something special and desirable and functional. And so the question that I think you and I must wrestle with is what must we do in order for the potter to have maximum impact in our lives? What are things that you and I, we as a collective can do in order, in order for the clay to be shaped after the will and the imagination of God. Because I want to remind you that the potter has an imagination about the collective, about even you as the individual that will far surpass anything you could dream up for yourself. How many of you know God's imagination is much bigger than your own dreams for yourself? Hallelujah. How many of you know that God has a plan that even if you spent eternity trying to craft for yourself, God's kind of, kind of running thought about you has a better outcome than your deliberate strategic planning for yourself. So what God is inviting you and I to think about in this moment is, if God is the potter, now I'm talking about God, I'm not talking about CNN, I'm not talking about your cultural kind of, you know, uh, 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 identification or, or, or theories. I'm talking about the Almighty, the one who has more power than you or we could ever amass. There is one greater than us. And there is a history of this greater one's activity in the world. 
if this God has a plan for you and I, the question for you and I is, number one, how much time do we spend in the hands of the potter? Can clay be formed outside of the hands of the potter? It's an existential question. It's a question of very deep implications. My answer is yes, clay can always be formed by external forces. You know, like my daughter, Nyla, started learning how to make, uh, I call it slob. I don't know what she calls it. It's, it's slime. <laughs> See, I grew up watching, you know, we weren't supposed to watch some of the, the horror shows my dad used to watch. Yeah, they, they, you know, one was called The Blob growing up. I don't know if y'all y'all have never seen The Blob. You gotta be kind of old to understand what The Blob is. But The Blob, The Blob was just this, this look, this, 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 this stuff that would just, everywhere it went, it would touch, it would just absorb you. You know, it looked very harmless, but you know, it was quite deadly. Nyla likes to make that, praise God. And so we go to the store and I'm trying to buy groceries for the house and she wants me to get detergent and you know, all these ingredients so she can make the blob or slime, whatever y'all want to call it. But she leaves it all over the house, you know. She 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 mixes it in a big old tub and you know, you know, she puts coloring in it and, and you know, all kind of stuff. And so she literally leaves it all over the house. And, you know, kids don't clean up, praise God. They 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 have a I don't want to clean up spirit. <laughs> And so, you know, I can be walking somewhere minding my own business and I will step on the blog. And the trauma from watching my dad's shows is I'm thinking this thing's about to envelop my whole leg and I'm going to it. But none of the blob looks the same when Nyla leaves it all over the house. It depends on what is the external reality. If it's on the floor, it's flat. If I step on it, it gets real flat. <laughs> she bakes it in a cup, she pours it upside down, and it'll always look differently. She did not form it to be that different. The external conditions were forming it without the blob's permission. Clay can be formed outside of the hands of the living God. It is not a given that just because you are being formed, that we are being formed by the hands of the potter. So the question we have to always ask ourselves is, am I a pleasing sight in the hands of the potter. And the only way you know that is to spend time with the potter. And how many of you know too many of us in one of the most consequential moments in our history? Because I want you to understand that we right now are living, you know some, we live in California so we don't fully appreciate it, but some of us online who, who travel a lot or who are living in other parts of the country know that we are living in one of the most consequential moments in our history. We are living through an age of pandemics that will not end very soon. We won't know the full impact of the last two years for probably another 20 years. But we do see some things. High levels of depression. Long COVID meaning long-term physical illness. We see massive deaths. We are living in one of the most consequential moments of our time. We have political violence and our country's infrastructure is failing. Jackson, Mississippi, folk don't have water. I want you to think about it. We 
who live here and you know, we appreciate East Bay mud and the San Francisco water. How many know there are people all over the country who don't have healthy water? We have 53% of Republicans who believe we will be in a civil war. 53% of Republican voters who claim to follow Jesus now believe we will be in a civil war. We have progressive and Democrats who want to relaunch crime bill 2.0. We're living in one of the most consequential moments in our lives. And my question to us is, while we go through the course of our lives, how much time are we spending in the hands of the potter? Not to escape, believe me. I'm not telling any of us we're trying to escape the world because it's not going to happen. You know, I'm trying to move my sister a whole bunch of folks. Y'all got to come back to California because if the Civil War started starting down there in Mississippi, Tennessee, I mean, they ain't coming to Oakland. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> we, we already got a Civil War. It's called East Oakland against West Oakland, Hunters Point against Fillmore, you know, Crest Town against North Bridge. We got our own Civil War. We trying to work out. But how you know Bubba and the Patriots, they ain't coming to East Oakland. Praise God. They, ain't, I mean, they better be coming with more, more they got. <laughs> Wish I could talk to somebody in here. But how many of you know that consequential times? And if we aren't in the hands of the potter, being willing to have the potter tell us, yes, you are a vessel, but you're spoiled in my hands. Yes, you are a vessel. I'm not denying that you are something special, but you have been, you have been misformed. In my hands. So what does the potter do? The potter adds usually some water. While the thing is spinning, the potter adds some water. Why? Because it loosens up the vessel that has become too rigid to change. Lord, help me in here today. I know it's hard for some of us to admit that we become more rigid than we have dynamic and flexible. But if I were to use a theological description of what it means to add some water, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's liquid to make you and I more palpable in the hands of the potter. But how many of you know that sometimes we don't, we're, we're not really, you know, given to Time with God in prayer, time with God in reflection, time with God in spiritual disciplines. And so it means that we become rigid, easily broken, dare I say, easily deceived. But what would it look like if the flaws in the vessel that the potter sees the potter looks and says, there's healing that needs to happen in this area of your life. So the potter says, let me add some Holy Spirit to this part of your life. There's some deliverance that needs to happen in this part of your life. Let me add some to this part of your life. There's some forgiveness that needs to happen in this part of your life. Let me add. Why? Because if, 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 if you don't allow me as the potter to add to your current vessel, you will be like the blob. That's just situated around the houses of life. And external conditions are always over determining your end. Rather than you consciously aware that God, you are at work. And so, I'm, I'm closing, but I, I, I want you to appreciate, if I'm conscious that God is at work in you, and I'm conscious that God is at work in me, we will always be patient with one another. As we go through the process of transformation. But when I don't think God is at work in you, 
And you know, this is where God, you know, kind of be on my back. Cause you know, I'm quick to say somebody full of the devil. And most of the time I'm right, praise God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And God be like, no, you're not, but you know, God's working on me. Be patient with me. God's not through with me yet, amen? But the moment I don't extend patience to whom God is working with, whether it's my child, whether it's my coworker, whether it's my professor, whether it's my business partner, whether it's my family member, the moment that I stop extending to them the patience that God is working on them, you know what happens? The water leaves, the rigidity sets in, and I can too easily break someone, cause harm to someone. And I want you to think about this. God as the potter is not trying to cause harm to the clay. God says, I'm reworking it. So one question I have for you, child of God, is where is God reworking? some things in your life? What attitudes, what dispositions, what sensibilities, what relational dynamics is God trying to rework in your life? Be honest with yourself about God, are you working in me or am I content to just allow external forces to determine my end. Number two, where in the world do you see God needing, wanting to correct that which has run or gone amiss? We call that injustice. We call that you know, wickedness in high places. We call that systemic and structural racism, exclusion. Where do you see this evil in the world? Why is that important? Because as we pray on Tuesday nights, I'm gonna thank God for Pastor Nisha's vision of making our prayer time a more focused time of prayer, right? We must pray specifically in this unprecedented season of turmoil and challenge, both personally and communally and nationally and globally. I'm not someone, you know, I, I was asked to join a board of the Quincy Institute. It's an international, what's that? I'm sorry, it's a national think tank about demilitarizing the world. And so, you know, former Department of Defense officials and, you know, philanthropic folks and posse folks, and we're talking about all the war making that's happening all over the world. And, and so, you know, I was in a briefing this week and they were talking to me about the, the, the nuclear t catastrophe that is, is literally like pending in Ukraine. Right now, amen, that, you know, a literal nuclear accident could happen any moment and drop nuclear rods deep down into the earth and cause a global catastrophe. Literally, right now, while we over here drinking lattes, <laughs> the world is on the brink of a nuclear catastrophe that could impact the ecological, the already weak and fragile ecological system. So I know so we got this time for us to pray and seek the face of God, not out of fear, but out of a sense of responsibility. If we are called to help steward creation, our prayers must go beyond the cars and the booze and the houses and the, the radical obsession with my own personal aggrandizement. Don't mean you don't ask God for what you need, but how many know some of the things we say we need is actually what we want? I want or we need clean drinking water. Hello, somebody. Our loved ones at Jackson cannot take a shower, cannot brush their teeth. We're, we're working with folks to bring trucks load, 35 trucks of just bottled water. I remember we, we had to deal with this in Flint. Yeah. Yeah. But Flint was not even the worst case in Michigan. There were several other cities that did not have clean water. And this is happening in so many places across the country. So my hope and my prayer for us is God as you shape us. As we seek your face, may we also 
Seek to learn and know and be conscious of where you're at work in the world to correct injustice. So God, certainly help me be a better, more faithful follower of your ways, but also God, help us steward creation in ways that cause peace and justice and hope and healing to be unleashed in the world. This is the way Jesus taught us to pray. On earth, your will be done as it is in heaven. When was the last time you prayed for it? God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many know the idea of heaven would mean that there is no violence and exploitation, murder and hatred and exclusion? When was the last time you prayed for that in your own family, in your own circle? When was the last time as we drive through the 10 cities all in our own Bay Area? How many of us were born and raised in, in the Bay Area our whole life? How many can testify that we didn't grow up with skid rolls on every street in the Bay Area? There was one part of the region that was ten, the Tenderloin. And that was created by Ronald Reagan in the 80s when he shut down all the mental hospitals and literally dropped folk off at a park in downtown called the Tenderloin. Even that was created by human greed and mismanagement. Now we have folks literally living outside. And did you know people are living outside because there are foreign business folk buying up big plots of property to house their money. Folks ain't outside because all of a sudden they just decide I'm not gonna work today. I'm closing with this, but I remember a couple years ago when the first tent city popped up right here on the side of the church. And I went out, we went out, we were serving them spaghetti and you know, trying to help the neighbors. Everybody was trying to call the police on them. And then, you know, I said, well, you know, I'm not calling police on nobody. We're gonna go out here, we're gonna try to help these folk. And when the police came, you know, I tried, tried to help them, you know, blah, 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 and you know, make sure nobody got arrested. And, and, and I was talking with one woman, she in her 60s, I think, she said that she lived in the same apartment for 20 years, and someone bought her apartment bill, and over 30 days tripled the rent. Lived in the same place for 20 years. She was out of relationship with two of her children and just got back into relationship with one of them. And the son was wiring her money, but it was gonna take three, four days to arrive. She said, I came to this little tent city because they said this was the safest one in Berkeley. Nobody was getting robbed and assaulted here. So I'm just here for three days, Pastor, if you could just let me stay here. I said, well, you know, first of all, you know, this is not my tent city. So, you know, you can stay wherever you want to stay. You know, I'm not like, you know, taking applications, praise God. <laughs> but the more I talk to folks, there are more people living in tent cities because literally, the rent has been tripled in this region over the last several years. Do you not know there are more Airbnb properties that are empty in the Bay Area than there are unhoused people living outside? That is not God's will on earth as it is in heaven. But I bet you some of these Airbnb folks, they attend in the church. Some, some of them may be you. I don't know. I don't know. So the question I have is how is it that we could own property that is empty while people are sleeping outside? Who told us that that was the right use of our wealth? That's not the way of the potter. I don't know whose way that is. But if that is us, and believe me, I just picked one, but there's a lot of complicity in this room, yeah. in the virtual church, in all of our churches. My refrain for all of us is, please be patient with us. Because I do believe God is shaping a new brand of followers who will be filled with God's spirit, but not so we can perform magic tricks in church on a Sunday 
so we can help facilitate miracles in the world throughout the week. Come on, stand with me, everyone, and let's, let's take a moment to pray. You know that song, Please Be Patient With Me? Y'all know that? You don't know that? In another life, when I had a voice, I would try to sing it. But I'll just say the words. James says, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. The next part says, when God gets through with me. When God gets through with me. When God gets through with me. I shall come forth. Hey, I shall come forth. Hey, I shall come forth like pure gold. All right, that's enough of that. We'll find it. It's an old school James Cleveland song. Grab the hand of someone next to you or their elbow. Just, just touch them with some love and some appreciation. I just want us to make a connection with somebody. God, as I touch my loved one, as I touch my fellow sojourner in this, the way of Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that you will continue, Lord God, to shape us and to make us after your image. You are the potter. We are the clay. God, I, I can acknowledge and confess that sometimes I get confused about who the potter is. I get confused about if the one shaping my thoughts and my responses is the potter described in the sacred text or the external conditions of just being left unattended to in the world? And so, God, I pray that you will help us as a people always ask questions and not delude ourselves and think that the conclusions we are arriving at are conclusions that are a reflection of you the great architect, creator, sustainer of all creation, the one who has eternity in mind, who has given us wisdom and knowledge through the ages as a lesson, as a guide for what right and wrong, what proper and improper, what just and unjust, what healing and trauma looks like. God, you've helped us to not live in a vacuum. And so God, I pray that the intentionality of your work, your arms, your legs, your will, may it work on us, God. May it shape us after your own will, God. Do it in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that we who are the clay, God, as you work on us, God, life has, 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 has introduced many flaws in the design. God, trauma and betrayal and and, 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 and injury and, and hopelessness and depression and illness and sickness. All of these things, God, they visited our lives in various different seasons of our lives. And they've left a bit of a flaw. God, I pray that the spirit of the living God, your spirit, will be introduced in a way, God, that puts us back in your hands like clay, like putty. So you can rework us. Hallelujah so healing can be introduced so restoration can be introduced so god hope and strength and love can be introduced back into our lives and so god i pray you will do it in a powerful and in a mighty way god do it for my loved one my brother my sister do it lord god for the person that i'm touching now lift those hands right where you are it's me god and i stand in the need of prayer it is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. God, make me over again. Hallelujah. Lord God, give me what I need, Lord God, for this journey ahead. Lord God, help me, God, to say yes to your will. Help me to say yes to your way. Help me to say, God, I will do, I will go, I will be whatever you have called me to do and so God as I lift my hands God I ask you Lord God to take my heart take my mind take my will and form it all God 
Lord, do it in a way, God, that is undeniable. Do it in a way, God, that brings you glory. Do it in a way, God, that makes us whole. And we'll say thank you, God. We'll say thank you, God. Take my